Welcome to the handover video for your new Globe Car Campster. We'll start our tour on the outside of the vehicle, starting first on the driver's side of the vehicle. When you open the door into the driver's compartment, you'll find on the inside of the driver's door the operating buttons for the electrically operated rear view mirrors, the selection button for which mirror will be adjusted, and the buttons for the windows in the front drivers and the passenger door. We'll run through how everything works on the dashboard once we're inside the vehicle. Continuing our tour of the vehicle, behind the driver's door there is the entrance door into the campster. There are doors on both sides of the campster vehicle and when we open the other door we'll show you how this section, the kitchen section, can be removed. Continuing around the rear of the vehicle, one of the uh, unique features of the campster is the fact that as well as a fully functioning tailgate. As you can see here, and again we'll look at what is located in the rear of the vehicle shortly, but you also get the ability to just open the back window on a nice day. And the catch for that is under here. Releasing the rear window, which is on two stays. Now, when the rear window is open, you cannot open the full tailgate, so don't worry about accidentally opening the tailgate with the window open and damaging the window against the pop up roof when the roof is up. Continuing around to the side of the vehicle is the uh, 230 volt input when you're on the campsite. Now, when we're inside, we'll connect this up so that we can demonstrate how everything works on the inside of the vehicle. Now, you'll notice that uh, the cable is connected to the plug-in point here. The way you actually connect a cable to a vehicle is you connect the vehicle first so that you are not playing with a live plug when it goes in there. You then connect your other end to the, um, the power point on the campsite, then you switch on, but only once both connections have been made. We continue around the side of the vehicle, we come to the near side door, and from here you can see that you can access the kitchen area, which is removable in the camster, and we'll come to how that is removed when we're looking at the interior of the vehicle. Down in the footwell of the passenger door is the bonnet release. And once you've released the bonnet, you can then get underneath the bonnet and I'll show you what's in there next. Underneath the bonnet, you'll find the filler cap for the windscreen washer bottle. That is coolant level. Now in a brand new vehicle, you're not gonna to have to go anywhere near that between servicing. Oil filler cap is there, dipstick is there. Underneath the vehicle, you'll find in there, that is the reservoir for the brake fluid. Once again, not something you're going to have to go anywhere near in a new vehicle. Vehicle battery with obviously plus and round here negative, although if you get a, if you're having to jump start, you get a plus on there and then a good earth point anywhere in the vehicle. And down in there is the steering fluid for the power steering. Uh, again, you won't have to go anywhere near that. The locking mechanism to release the pop-up roof has got a secondary safety strap on it, which you take away first. It then has a lock 
which you turn through 180 degrees to unlock. Repeat the process on the other side, safety strap and lock, and then simply using the two grab rails, push the roof and the roof will rise. To slide the rear seats backwards and forwards for either giving more storage space or to make the bed up, simply raise the bar underneath the seat and push the seat backwards or forwards. To convert the rear seat into the bed, you first of all slide the seat as far forward as it will go. Then you remove the two headrests and using the lever here, drop the back of the seat down into a horizontal position. Once you have the rear of the seat in the horizontal position, this gap here can be closed by again raising the bar at the front and sliding the seat back. When not being used as a camper van, the rear cushion and the parcel shelf below can be removed and stored in the garage. To remove the rear parcel shelf, undo the two clips on either side, which allows it to rise up. This will also expose the location of the table for inside the lounge area. And then the table back just simply slides off the two catches located here and here. Stored in the rear of the vehicle, you will find your toolbox and a complimentary set of dog friendly air vents to go into the two front windows. The rear seat of your campster runs on rails and it can be slid all the way to the rear of the vehicle to give you a maximum amount of cargo space at the front of the vehicle. To allow the rear seat to travel all the way to the back, this last corner piece, which is part of the rear parcel shelf that forms the bed, has to be removed. To remove it, undo these two bolts there. This will free the fifth rail. There's one rail, two, three, four, and there's another one underneath the kitchen area at the front. With that rail free, your rear seat can then travel all the way back to here. Still leaves you a little bit of storage space at the back of the vehicle, but it gives you a massive load space in the middle of the vehicle. With the rear parcel shelf away, we're able to view and see the spaces that are here. Storage cupboard one. Storage cupboard two, which also contains your RCD trip switches and a handy storing place for the legs for the kitchen, as well as the umbilical cord, which is, allows you to take the 12 volt supply to the water pump in the kitchen when the kitchen is remote from the vehicle. You'll also see that you can get into the larger of the two cupboards, your wardrobe cupboard, from here as well. Also, while this is out, I can show you where your leisure battery is stored. It's stored there. If you wish to remove the kitchen unit from the vehicle and use it perhaps in an awning or out in the sunshine for some alfresco cooking, there are two screws that have to first be released. In the base of the kitchen unit, there is the fresh and grey water tanks. Underneath the fresh water tank, you'll see there is a hole with a bolt similar to the one that we removed 
at the rear of the vehicle to give you access to sliding the seat all the way back, the rear seat all the way back. So you unscrew that, that's the first of two screws to be undone. If you do have any water in either of your jerry cans, you would be best advised to remove the jerry cans from the kitchen unit as uh, a full jerry can does add quite a bit of weight to the unit. So remove both of those. In here is normally where your gas bottle would be and if you've got a full gas bottle and you're lifting it on your own it might be an idea to remove the gas bottle. If there's two of you there's absolutely no need to remove the gas bottle. Having removed the screw from the locker where your water bottles are, you come inside the vehicle and take that board away and this is behind your gas locker inside the vehicle and you'll see in there that there is another bolt to be undone. Once that bolt is undone, your entire kitchen unit easily lifts out of the vehicle. Disconnecting the kitchen section from the campster. First the umbilical cord, it just pulls away. Caps go on to protect the contacts. Then you open the water locker. Take out the fresh water bottle. Underneath the fresh water bottle there is a hole in the floor. Inside that hole there is a screw that you undo. screw I'm assuming into a block in the runner similar to what we have on the outside after the screw at the front has been undone you take away this panel in the inside of the kitchen area where there is a second bolt so you take that off the unit should now lift out. Once the kitchen unit is out, there are two legs which go into the bottom. They're held in place with two screws, two hand-held or hand-turned screws. There you now have the kitchen outside of the vehicle. And finally, reattach the umbilical cord, which is surprisingly long. There are three controls which make up the operation of your Campster motorhome. At the top, on the left hand side, you've got this 12 volt switch which turns on and turns off the 12 volt supply within the van. The access that you have to the leisure battery also activates any 12 volt sockets that are available. Above that, when you're plugged into mains, uh, you'll see an indicator light coming on here. This is working your mains charger. It's also working any three pen uh, power sockets that are available inside the van. You can monitor the condition of your leisure battery by selecting this and you'll see a series of traffic lights uh, light up indicating the health and condition of the leisure battery. Directly below this control panel is linked to the cab heating system so when the vehicle is in motion passengers in the back can control both the heat output and the speed of the fan for the recirculatory system that's coming from the air conditioning or coming from the heat controls uh, from the cab. Over on the right hand side you have your Wabasco diesel heater. The little dot at the top is your air temperature sensor. Below it you have the actual control panel. When you first turn it on you'll see a white light which will go to green and you can very quickly, seeing these symbols here, increase or decrease uh, the heat output within the van. When you initially start it up, you will get a smell of diesel outside and adjacent to the vehicle. Perfectly normal, perfectly natural, it's just the initial startup sequence. Touch the control button and 
it goes to a white function and you can go backwards and forwards on the display. If you want to just use it as a fan control, so perhaps in warmer weather, you just want to turn over the airflow in the van, then you can do so. Um, as opposed to having a manual control via the heating system, you can go in and actually set up a timer. So if you want, the, for example, the diesel heater to kick in at eight o'clock tomorrow morning and start running up, then you can do so and it will go off after a certain period of time. If the vehicle is low on diesel, the unit will cut out. It doesn't exhaust the entire supply of diesel that's in the fuel tank. So the likelihood is if the Wabasco unit cuts out, it's likely to leave about a third of uh, a tank of diesel actually in the vehicle itself. So you still have some range left available uh, to be able to get yourself moved on to the next uh, location. Finally, if you scroll all the way through on this one, there is a settings button and that enables you to access things like the time clock, set up the timers and so on and so forth. If it's showing white then it will go into a sleep mode after a period of time um, and all of the display will go off. Obviously if it's on the green then it's working at the function that you've selected be it ventilation or heat. On the countertop below the control panel you have your access controls for the fridge and also a mains power socket so if you are plugged in onto the main supply you can access and use that port just there to turn on the 12 volt cool box press and hold in on the on switch for a couple of seconds and you'll see a light display come up at the end uh, runs on a scale from 1 to 10 it's increased or decreased using the up and down arrows the higher the number, the colder the fridge box will become. To turn the unit off, press and hold on the extreme right hand button again. And that will then disable and switch off that unit. Opening up the fridge door, just lift up on the traps and obviously then it gives you access then into that fridge. For the use of the hob and the sink, you have an electronic igniter down on the left hand side of the burner arrangement. Push down on your burner, press down on your igniter and you'll get a solid jet of gas coming through and you should be able to light up. Hold it down for a few seconds to allow that thermocouple to establish and it's the same for the rear one to allow that one to bite as well. There's no isolator on these lids. If the lids are brought down over the flames, they will continue to burn. They will shatter the glass. So let everything cool down thoroughly before you close the lids down. Cold water feed comes via the tank, uh, which is uh, located inside this unit. When you turn on your tap, you should get your water supply coming through. You'll hear the buzz at the moment because we've got the system drained off because of the cold climate. So with the vehicle started, you have a range of options. Uh, we'll begin over with the stereo unit. Um, you have a straightforward DAB radio access controls. If you go into your settings menu, however, you are able to adapt the configuration and add in additional pieces of equipment, such as your Bluetooth for your telephone as well. Um, these also will give you um, access to uh, photo files if you want to use a USB stick and add in images um, as backdrops uh, to the display. You also have a configuration one which will give you uh, the time and use of your controls as well and also uh, the facility for turning on the stop start motion, um, activating cruise control, parking sensors and so on and so forth. Below, over on the left hand side, you have your fan controls, so you have your recirculate and the directional controls. You can increase and decrease the temperature on the left or on the right hand side of the vehicle. Um, you can increase and decrease the span feed of the fan um, on the controls that are over on the right. Heated rear window, um, you can isolate the fan controls in the back of the vehicle if you so wish. Uh, the automatic function will work in conjunction and stabilize the temperature within the van and then you also have a uh, windscreen function and air conditioning buttons there. Child locks can be activated onto the sliding doors. You can lock the vehicle in its entirety from that switch. Uh, you have your hazard light switch in the, located into the middle. 12 volt socket and USB, the USB being connected up to the DAB unit. 
reverse on these up on the central column and then over and back to engage reverse steering wheel controls are connected to the stereo for volume and configuration options as well as your mobile phone left hand stalk is the controls for your automatic lights um, and dipped and main beam and then also any uh, front or rear fog light switches are controlled from the inner part of the wheel as well as your indicators as well over to the right hand side stalk and that's all of your wiper controls for intermittent and also an automatic function as well on the door your electric mirror and electric window functions and down below you have the controls for adapting the headlamp beam and also for isolating and turning off the alarm system so if you want to spend the night in the vehicle you could turn off the internal alarm or if the vehicle has ever been towed then the alarm unit can be turned off as well the sensors are located at the top of the screen there and then the rest of the controls up into the headlining are for reading lights and interior lights within the van. Little cubby hole in the centre of the dash and you've got other cubby holes and storage obviously located around the inside of the van. On behalf of Highland Camper Vans, I sincerely hope you enjoy your new van. Um, if you have any further questions as to its operation, then please get in contact with us and we'll happily answer your questions. Take care, all the best.